this, it was given me to know that many films have been spoiled by the panel of peril. And this too was given me to know that the film Krull would also be spoiled. This is Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends and one newly suffering guest dissect films most dastardly schemes, then compete to improve them. This week's movie is 1983 fantasy cult favourite, Crow. So, Peril Pals, assemble a party of British screen legends, embark upon an extremely unsafe-looking trek through difficult terrain, and let's get Diabolical. Welcome to this special episode. I'm your host, Craig, and with me is the panel of Peril, who will compete against each other as we each try to come up with the best alternative plan for the villain of the movie before we vote to crown the most diabolical. As ever, I'm joined by regular panel members, Adam. Hello. Ben. Hello. Gaz. Hello. And joining the panel of Peril today, host of Matt Spectro Through the Multiverse, Matt Spectro. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. I've guested on your show twice now, so we're well overdue. Yeah, we talked Flashpoint last time. Flashpoint, yeah. So uh, check that out, Peril Pals. That was a fun time. Uh, now, as a guest panel member, we're required to conduct a psychological test to determine just how diabolical <laughs> you are. And this is a this is a proper scientific test, and Ben's going to go through the questions now. Matt, it's a bit like a Rorschach test. So please answer honestly with the first thing that pops into your head. Batman or Superman? Superman, all day. <laughs> cape or no cape? <laughs> I'm going to say cape. Yeah, I'm going to go cape. Cape. It's a tough okay. one, but cape. Yeah. Marvel or DC? I grew up a Marvel fan, but as an adult, I really have gone towards DC way more than Marvel. So uh, mm-hmm. if we're going right here and now, then yeah, DC Comics. They say, okay. Villains or heroes? I'm going to go heroes. Heroes. I do love villains, but, well, God, this is so tough. (laughs) I'm thinking comic books the whole time, but villains is really the whole spectrum of of entertainment. I might go villains if we're talking, yeah, beyond comic books, I'll probably go villains. Comic books have a villain problem often, don't they? Like, uh... Yes, they certainly do. It's getting worse with time. (laughs) The Odd Hero has the great rogues gallery, and then at least the perception is that a lot of the more popular heroes don't have any interesting villains to fight or anyone who's on par with their kind of skill set. Well, for like Batman's got the greatest rogues, but then you go to like Daredevil who's got the stilt man. (laughs) The big whale. The big whale's my favorite Daredevil. Big wheel, yeah. (laughs) Dope boy. Doorman. Pace Pop Pete. (laughs) Wasn't there one that can just turn into a door? He's He's not a villain, though. That's okay. a heroic uh, trait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I open doors, not close them. <laughs> All right, next question. Pizza superpower. Speedy delivery or it never gets cold? I Speedy delivery. Who doesn't love cold pizza? Exactly. <laughs> Binge read or watch or space out for enjoyment? Uh, I wish I could say binge read, but I, I, I'm I'm inherently lazy, so I'm going to go with binge watch. <laughs> All right. For a chance to experience your favorite story again, as if it were the first time, all you have to do is steal candy from a child. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> do, we have, do we have an age group for the child? <laughs> <laughs> uh, has to be young enough that they won't put up a fight, I guess. <laughs> or, no, or young enough where they've got like a vice-like grip and they're unwilling to let it go at all. And you've really got to drag it away from them. As long as it's not my own children, then I'll, I'll take the can. <laughs> as would we all, I think. You have to erase one comic book event from history. What's your pick? Uh, identity crisis my most hated comic book of all time i would erase that from ever happening <laughs> <laughs> explain for the uh, peril pals what identity crisis is and, and why it's so hateful uh, for me it's just it's this terrible 
Justice League a comic book where the artwork is fantastic. I don't want to take anything away from Rags Morales, mm-hmm. but where they reveal that this is so unpleasant that Sue Dibney, a long man's wife, was raped by Dr. Light. So the Justice League decided to erase his memory of it ever happening, which explained why he was a bumbling idiot for so long. <laughs> right. And then it Jeez. goes to a series of events where the Justice League has been doing this to a bunch of villains, and Superman knows about it, and they do it to Batman. It's just... <laughs> Terrible, wow. terrible. Wow. So v- wow. Sounds very lighthearted. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm fine with the whole you know, anti-hero and black and white, but I don't want mm. that for the Justice League. No. no. I'm happy with those stories when they're like Elseworld stories, but when they creep into main continuity, I think that's not what, <laughs> what those heroes should be doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't want to get a whole leftist, rightist thing. You can say what you want about Green Arrow now, but at the time, Green Arrow, who was always portrayed as a super progressive liberal, Mm. It just seems so weird to me. He would be not only for this, but would. This is a guy who calls yeah. the cops fascists when they just pull him over for running a red light. But he's all on board for <laughs> a, destroying the free will of a bunch of supervillains. Right. Yeah. And it also does the trope of Batman's the smartest guy in the world, except when he's not. When the plot needs him <laughs> not to be smart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just hate that story so much. Yeah. Wow. Well, Rightly yeah. so. It's a hot question. But I mean, if you wanted to eliminate something, you, that I don't know how much long-term effects that have had. It's, it's, it's not like one more day or something where mm. Spider-Man fans are still feeling the effects of that storyline. So. Yeah, what a bunch of fucking nerds. <laughs> <laughs> My final question coming up. Prepare yourself. Which supervillain do you most identify with? I de- <laughs> that is, it's that loaded. Is a tough one. <laughs> oh, I gotta think about that one for a minute. <laughs> I feel like it would be one of the more lower level ones that you know doesn't have a lot of success, but never never <laughs> gives up. Like like the Shocker or something. Like that. Yeah, right. or like uh, Porcupine when he all he wanted to do was was sell his suit because he didn't want it, and, and nobody yeah. wanted to buy it. <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to say Doctor Doom or Lex Luthor or something. Right. Like I, I, I'm probably one of those level, low level guys that never gives up, but never really has. <laughs> Tremendous success. All right. So we're identifying with Shocker. We're stealing candy from a child whilst not wearing a cape. Okay, I'm going to award you seven florets of broccoli. Oh, and where does that compare on the on the scale so far with our previous guests? Well, you're three florets of broccoli more evil than our first guest, David Quantic. Mm. But you are not as evil as an enemy, Craven, our most recent guest, who I think scored eight. Oh. Is ten the highest you can get? Or? No, there's, nobody there's no, knows. No, no. There's no it's a noble <laughs> scale. <laughs> One of life's great and nobles. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for being a good sport. Oh, anytime. <laughs> Some tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were scientifically determined, as you know. <laughs> In Krull, alien despot the Beast invades the eponymous planet, seeking a queen to fulfil a prophecy that foretells of a royal heir set to rule the galaxy. Meanwhile, the native Prince Colwyn and Princess Lyssa plan to wed in order to ally their two kingdoms against the Beast and his army of slayers. In the first of a handful of similarities to long-running UK soap opera EastEnders, (laughs) the slayers crash the wedding, decimating the forces of Krull, kidnapping the Princess Lyssa and injuring the Prince Colwyn, who must then embark on a perilous journey to retrieve a fabled weapon that can destroy the beast and reunite Colwyn with his betrothed. Along the way, Colwyn enlists a fellowship of British talent, including Hagrid, Tucker Jenkins from Grange Hill, <laughs> Carry On Stalwart Bernard Breslau, and Liam fucking Neeson! <laughs> Krull was a critical and commercial flop, but what did the panel make of it? Now, Matt, this was your choice. So, first of all, what made you choose Krull? Well, I love, I love the early '80s wave of Conan type knockoffs that came yeah. when I was six. I love all those fantasy movies from that era. Yeah, I was looking for something for the '80s for us to do, and I went through a lot of the list. I'm like, ah, oh, uh, they hadn't done Krull, and it's such a 
I love the movie, but it's such a ridiculous movie. I thought yeah. it really lent itself to your guys' podcast. Yeah, it really fits in our wheelhouse, yeah. Yeah. We've done a few 80s fantasy things, but uh, this is the first time watch for me. Me too. Yeah. And knew of it, and I think, do they discuss it on Spaced or only Hawk the Slayer? I think it's Hawk the Slayer, isn't Hawk it? The Slayer. No, they, no, no, they yeah. say Hawk the Slayer is rubbish. Do, do, does Matt know the connection, the Colwyn connection? Well, I was going to come on to that. So Prince Colwyn... Uh, is the name of the lead character in Krull, and Colwyn is where we come from. It's the name of our town. <laughs> it's where we grew up. <laughs> we are. And I've never heard that name used for a character anywhere else. No. It blew my mind when that when that came it's on. It's odd, isn't it? And there's a character in this called Onir, and I have a friend called Onir, so yeah, that's quite weird as well. Yeah. You don't often see Welsh names in... Uh... Yeah. I wouldn't call this a Hollywood movie. It was shot at Pinewood, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so weird array of British talent in it. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the actors in it, but one of the younger yeah. guys is an actor called Todd Carty, who we'll know from a, a huge hit with kids' TV in the UK. It's Grange Hill. It's about a high school. And he went then went on to be in EastEnders, which you may have heard of. It's like one of the longest-running shows on UK television. Yeah, I've heard of that one, East End. Yeah, it's kind of famous for, for being uh, relentlessly awful. Like uh, depressing, Great. yeah. David Bowie once described it as modern day Shakespeare or Dickens. I can't remember which one he said, but yeah, he was he was a big fan of it. Yeah. So it kind of it, it has a huge. It's like a household name here. And then obviously, Carry On movies. You you must be familiar with uh, Bernard Breslau plays the Cyclops in this. Liam Neeson, who let's be honest. He's not great in this, is he? I'm kind of surprised he got any work after this. <laughs> He's got a good death scene. Was it? Very good. It's not a Sean Bean level good death scene, is it's, it? It's, it's... Yeah, it's Qui-Gon Jinn level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think Qui-Gon Jinn is slightly more moving than this, for me, at least. And, uh, the, the wizard... I can't remember his name. Uh, something the Magnificent. Yeah. yeah. I feel like Ergo. I've seen him in some. He's in well. Willy Wonka. The... Oh, yeah. That's where it's... <laughs> uh, and, of course, uh, Robbie Coltrane, you must be familiar with from, from Harry Potter. Although I read, but I didn't quite believe this, but his voice was dubbed over because it yeah. sounded like him. No, but it didn't. apparently uh, an actor called Michael Elphick did the, yeah. the voice. Uh, he was in a show called Boone. Yeah. And he was in EastEnders as well. I think he was in EastEnders as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Because the princess's voice was dubbed as well. Right. Yeah. yeah so, so she was the only American actress in the thing, so they dubbed her voice for. Yeah. And I think right. it's Strange because she was 17. She was 17 oh, and wow. didn't sound mature enough, yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's uh, for a UK audience at least, it's kind of a, a, a shock to see how many uh, kind of household names are in it. And I couldn't remember what I'd seen him in, but the the kind of leader of the party as well. He's I think he's in yeah. like brassed off stuff like yeah. that. He's like the poor man's Pete Postlethwaite. Oh, he's good. Like, uh, if you can't get Pete Postlethwaite, get Alan. What's his name? Alan. Oh, I'm gonna have to Google it now. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Alan Armstrong. Yeah, Alan Armstrong. Well, while we're speaking about him. He mm. is responsible for the slowest rollout of danger I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. But he doesn't roll out of danger either, does he? He rolls into the path of fire and then runs out of the corridor. It's really slowly. It takes him so long to get up. <laughs> so we know why you chose Krull. Let's go to Gaz next. Oh, you're getting the party pooper out of the way first, are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nothing personal, Matt. I, I usually say this sort of thing about these these kinds of films. I'm not a big science fiction or fantasy fan as a, as a broad rule. However, what I did like in Crawl was I thought the score was genuinely fantastic. Yeah. Right from oh, the yeah. opening credits, it's a very mm. pleasing mix of fantasy, like horn, uh, pomp and circumstance with more of a John yeah. Williams Star Wars type score sort of mashed up together. Yeah. James Horner? Really good. Yeah, yeah James, James Horner. Horner yeah. yeah. Didn't you get the Oscar for Titanic? I thought you were going to say for Crawl. <laughs> <laughs> you should have. It was a hell of a score. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a great score. score. The, the sets are fantastic. Like, like in the It previous... looks better than it should, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like Doctor Who yeah. and the Daleks, which we've covered previously. That right. They're enhanced by their artificiality to an extent, I think. Yeah. It adds another worldliness to it that's, that's quite pleasing. Mm. Um, and likewise, the location shooting is magnificent yeah. too. Yeah, some stunning British landscapes on show there. Yeah, just for me, that the the thing that detracts from it, which I think it's kind of 
from my limited perception of fantasy, the plot of most fantasy things, including the most famous, I would imagine, Lord of the Rings, is just kind of traipsing across the countryside to get to the bad guy. <laughs> it yeah. just you go from A to B, the end. Which for me, um, in Lord of the Rings it works because there's twelve hours of incident to go through, but but crammed into a two hour film, it just doesn't quite satisfy my need for engagement in a plot. Like the plot is basically five minutes at the start, isn't it? And then <laughs> like I say, they they're just going from A to B to, to get the beast. Um However, yeah. I did enjoy it. I watched it twice, in fairness. So <laughs> I couldn't have uh, disliked it that much, but still. <laughs> the structure that you're talking about reminded me of not the movie, but the video game Super Mario Brothers, which is where every time Mario gets to the castle, the toads <laughs> inform him that Peach has moved to a different yeah. castle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every time the castle teleported, I thought, how is this going to be resolved? <laughs> this is just gonna... uh, okay, let's go next to... Ben, for your thoughts on the film, please. I remember seeing this video in Colwyn Video, it was called. Back in those days, doesn't exist anymore, but the video rental shop. And it had the, the image of the glaive on there. And I was always fascinated mm. by it. And for whatever reason, we never rented it and I never saw it. So this was a first watch. So on paper, I should love it because I, I love all the 80s fantasy stuff. It's in, in the same mold as Labyrinth and Willow, Princess Bride. But just in its execution, it's just a little bit lacking. Perhaps, yeah, like we mentioned, that the story is just a little bit too incoherent for the for it to reach the same heights as its uh, as its peers, and it just felt a little bit easy and unearned most of the way through. But that said, I totally agree with Gaz. The score was amazing. The locations and sets were, were great, and the design of the glaive. It's mm. got to be one of the most iconic weapons other than a lightsaber, hasn't it? It's a, it's incredible. It's like something Yuffie would have in Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> a crazy, massive throwing star. It's incredible. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's really nice. So overall, it gets, for devotees of 80s fantasy, Kroll is definitely worth a watch. Just don't expect it to wield the same power as the legendary titans of the genre. What's that out of? That's out of five. Yeah, five, Ooh, five. Yeah. All right. Well, Adam, uh, what did you think of Krull? I couldn't remember seeing this film. And then it's the opening credits. And then when the glaive comes on, I was like, I remember it. And uh... yeah. And then as we went through, there were certain bits that I remembered from a kid. So uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm not bothered about the plot because it's loads of little adrenaline shots for me. Loads of little dopamine hits the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. um, there's loads of, yeah, like, like, uh, I agree with uh, all the positive points uh, Gaz and Ben both said. With, um, but there's uh, the fight scenes can be a little bit clunky, a bit too sort of like clunk clunks pause, doop doop pause and stuff. But yeah. I think all the all the creatures are brilliant. I love the beast. I think he's terrifying. He's like, what's the um, the film with uh, Tom Cruise and um, Tim Curry? Legend. Legend. Legend, yeah. Cocktail. So the yeah, cocktail. <laughs> it's a scary film. Yeah, Brian Brown. <laughs> the beast is up there with the legend, the, the the devil or whatever he is in that. Oh, Tim Curry. Yeah, it's a scary and oh, and um, the servant of the nothing from Never Ending Story. Those three are like mm. the top three eighties monsters, aren't they? That that put put the shit. What about uh, Dave Bowie's codpiece? That was an eighties monster. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but when you pull down his trousers, it just disappear. So, you know, <laughs> it was uh, all smoke and mirrors, all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> For me, yeah, it's got everything that I love about that period of filmmaking. Just lots of monsters, lots of silly action, some daft stuff by, you know, the pound shop, Eric Idle. Um, what's his name? <laughs> David, David Batley. Yeah. Going forward, yeah. Eric Idle. I like him. No, we'll yeah. get Dave Batley in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's great. He, he was very Eric Idle. Now you say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very Eric Idle. Especially if you see uh, the Adventures of Baron von Munchausen. Mm. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. So um, thanks, Matt, for picking this one and rekindling something of uh, my old memories of the film. I, I'd, I'd probably buy it on the physical copy, and I've seen this again. So really good. So I'm not exactly uh, winning you all over with <laughs> with <Crow. laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> don't speak too soon. I mean, as for me, like, I agree with all the kind of the uh, positive and negative points I've had so far. So I don't really want to go over any old ground. But overall, I had a, a fun time with Krell. 
I liked it more than I thought I would based on its reputation. As I said before, it looks far better than it has any right to. It's really well photographed. Mm. The sets and, and the costumes as well look great. I think there's some some production elements that suffer a bit due to budget, but as Gaz said, some of that is just charming. Mm. The matte paintings in particular look like they're not big enough for some of the sets, <laughs> but they still look really charming and great. One thing that I noted is at the start, you see the the castle, the spaceship castle coming into orbit, and um, to me, the model... It looks like if the Red Dwarf had been made of Cadbury Flake bars. <laughs> I did think Red Dwarf, now that you mention it, yeah. yeah. I, don't, it's quite I, Red I Dwarf-y, thought yeah. it was shot for shot, the opening of Star Wars, right along the Yeah, ship. I don't think yeah. that's probably not an accident. Yeah. Yeah. But the ambition of it, I mean, God, and, oh, the, and yeah. the cast, yeah. there's so many bits in it as well, like, like Adam said, that little set yeah. pieces that are great, reminding me yeah. of never any story in that regard. Just little set pieces that are so memorable. Uh, like the swamp sequence and the the climbing is like Tom Cruise level insane that Colwyn does. I was watching it thinking, there's no rope there. They didn't have he, did, he did a lot of his stun- own stunts, didn't he? Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I'm very glad that we watched it. I, I probably wouldn't have seen it if you hadn't brought it up. Yeah, exactly. For all its failings, it's more charming, and and I wouldn't pan it. I would definitely recommend people watch it. Mm. Well, for those of you who hadn't seen it before. The effects, do they stand out to you as bad or good? No, I think I, they've held up really well. Because sometimes you look back at something that came out in a different era and some people can't get past the special effect. That's never been an issue for me. I think they hold up really well, particularly yeah. the one standout sequence when the, the black castle is exploding at the end and everything's raising upwards to, to space. Yeah. And it looks tremendous. It's got real weight to it. It's got orbs yeah. of light like ghostbusters orbs of light raising with it that that's the standout sequence they, they filmed it upside down okay <laughs> they didn't reverse uh the flow of gravity on planet earth no no <laughs> they, fixed, they, fooled me. they tried they tried that first and when that, when that failed <laughs> getting a peek behind the curtain of hollywood here carol pals <laughs> Like supposedly this movie had a really high budget for its time. Like I think it was yeah. like forty million to make this movie. Okay. And, and yeah, they they took over a huge soundstage at Pinewood. I think about the 007 soundstage, mm. but it's huge. And they said it was so big that it gets its own weather systems in there. <laughs> Sometimes it can rain wow. in there. That's crazy, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've heard about that actually. Now you said that. You're crazy. I don't think you see all that budget on screen. You know, it doesn't look as good as say Star Wars, for example. But it it, it, no. it holds up really well. I think they they did a lot of no. work to match the practical effects to the you know rotoscope or visual effects they put on after, so that when you see the the laser bolts being fired and you get the shower sparks and stuff, all that stuff's really good. Mm. But you also get lens flare and glare effects everywhere. You can see that some love has been put into it. And I think if you cut half an hour out of this film, I think it would be really good. Just a yeah. little bit flabby in the middle practical effects tend to stand the test of time yeah better than cg right that's true yeah yeah, yeah the beast looks great and the slayers look great too those suits yeah. are cool uniforms generally yeah. quite striking yeah particularly when the, the helmets get smashed yeah. and they're squealing and the little yeah. technical things oh that's around. horrible yeah that's really good stuff <laughs> adam if you watch it with your kids let us know how they react to that <laughs> well i think that's going to segue nicely into our favorite moments from the movie because mine is the the death scene of the clone of the seer when he's a changeling and he kind of melts and he gets yeah. all the prostheses on his face and I thought that was fantastic, it's really good, genuinely unnerving, isn't it? He, he's squealing, yeah. high pitched as well, and becoming tumorous also, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Matt, what about you? What's your what's your favorite moment sequence from Krull? Uh Two favorite parts to me are uh, the Cyclops. I think it's great. Like, yeah, you you expect that to look bad. Or them to do like some sort of stop motion and not have it, but it's a guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big guy yeah. and he's got the eye. <laughs> and I think the Cyclops is tremendous in the movie. The movement of the eye is really good. And you kind of believe that he's a, a creature. I think it's great. And I love the whole, all the interior sets of the Black Fortress. Mm. I absolutely love. It's kind of a waste of time when she, they keep going to the princess just running around <laughs> the porches for no reason yeah you brought it up to me and like when you when you watch the movie on its own it's really unclear why the beast even kidnaps her like okay <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Like, not, that's not never even a, it. 
Is he just horny? Is there a reason <laughs> yeah. you have to be married? Like, I assume that he uh, he's heard of this prophecy as well, and he wants her to be the queen and him for himself to be the king of, of prophecy. But it's I don't logical. Think, yeah, but yeah. they never we... really say that. No. In the movie. Uh, I think there's a lot of that kind of thing throughout the movie where there's they know the logic of the world, but they don't mm. quite communicate it properly, and yeah. so we're left we're left guess filling the blanks. And sometimes that's good, but I think it's just a bit too much at times in this. So those sets I love, and it's great to see them, but they, they eat up a lot of screen time that I really think aren't necessary to the movie, really. I, right. I, I see the movie's flaws. I, I like it, despite the flaws of the film, and that yeah. they, they there are numerous. What about like a, a favorite moment? Oh, my favorite moment? I think when he gets the, the glaive the first time is my favorite moment, because even though the glaive doesn't, really do a lot in the movie it's just such a iconic cool moment when he climbs the mountain goes to the cave and he pulls out the glaive and you get that big moment of, of and the the knives come out of the thing that's yeah. probably my favorite moment of the movie i wish the glaive had been more consequential to the actual movie <laughs> do you think they'd, they'd established at that point because of the the wedding ceremony that these people of krull seem to be immune to the effects of fire because he looks nervous to put his hand into the lava to retrieve. Oh, I the didn't even click that. But he then he puts his hand in, and it you know his arm goes on fire. But then he's just fine. If you are immune to fire, that's fine. But why are you so nervous about putting your hand into this lava? <laughs> Let's hear next from Ben. Your favorite moment in Krull? My favorite moment was when they arrive at the fortress. And they're looking like they're going to get overwhelmed. And then riding like the cavalry comes uh, the Cyclops. And he mm. uh, bulldozes his way through and get, helps get them inside just before the fortress uh, yeah. vanishes and teleports Squ- to wherever it goes. Squashes him. You know it's coming after they leave him. You, you know that can't be it. But it's so great to see him riding on the, uh, what are they called, fire hooves. Mm. Uh, the horse. Fire mares. Yeah. Fire mares. Apparently those scenes were filmed by training the horses to run on treadmills. Oh, well, that's crazy. <laughs> Bloody hell. Yeah. Big treadmill. Christ. <laughs> that was another piece of law logic that I felt was a bit underexplained. These horses can fly and, and be on fire, but when they're capturing them, they're just running around like in a little yeah. gorge where they can easily be caught with a rope. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> uh, Adam, you have a favourite moment? Spiderweb. Spiderweb. You mm. son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so horrible. It's second only to Shelob, isn't it? I think, mm. really. Right. Uh, in the movie, movie spiders scares. Horrible. But yeah, really good. And I'm assuming, Gaz, that your favourite moment is the same. <laughs> well, just, just to expand slightly, uh, it's a smaller moment within, within that sequence in um, The Widow of the Web's lair. It's when the spider's sort of creeping along uh, the strands of the web to try and knock an air. Uh, off and it just starts sort of bouncing up and down yes. it's like like two little kids on on a rope at the park and one's trying to knock the other one off <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really peculiar like get off it get off it <laughs> sort of action like it's not intending to eat him or anything it just wants to annoy him by knocking him off <laughs> was that spider stop motion feels like it i think it must have movement. been must have been it was very well done yeah, yeah. It, was, it was gorgeous yeah i think they were getting to more sophisticated levels of stop motion by them, maybe. At first glance, I thought it might have been the uh, that Raquel Welsh film, however many thousand years BC, you know, where they do the, mm. the iguana and make it look massive. So I thought, is this yeah. a real spider and they've done that? Because huh. it yeah. just looked great. Yeah, possibly. Um, and, you know, they could have taken some frames out to make it look Hickey-jakey. moving in a strange way. Yeah, yeah. spiders right. are weird mapers, aren't they? Ugh, horrible yeah. bastards. <laughs> Does anyone have a favourite line of dialogue they'd like to share? What about Matt? Did you... Have a favorite line of dialogue from the movie. Um, don't ask me why, but uh, it's always stuck in my head since he's a kid. It's not even that great of a line, but when he says, uh, "Didn't you hear? We are now an army." I don't know why, <laughs> but that line <laughs> stuck in my head ever since I first saw the movie as a little kid. Nice. Uh, what about you, Gaz? I've got a, a brief exchange between Ergo and the Cyclops. Ergo says. My name is no jest, Beanpole. It's all very well to have a short name when you're 20 feet tall, but small people need large names to give them weight. And the Cyclops replies, your actions give you weight, my friend. It's quite a nice, yeah, quite nice. a nice little exchange, I thought. It's very nice, yeah. yeah. 
Mm. Uh, Adam, favourite line of dialogue? Yeah, it's Ergo again. He says, wait, I've just remembered. I have urgent business in this direction. And Corwin says, what business? Staying alive. <laughs> nice. Ben? When he's talking to his former lover, the old man, is it Ern- Ernia? What's his name? Ernia, yeah. He's talking to his former lover in the web. She holds up the, the timepiece because it can only be turned once. That is a law of the web. And it's just a bit of an example of those things that you're just told to buy. Just buy it. Don't question it. Just, yeah. just accept it. Who, who's there to police that law? The spider? Yeah. I don't make the law. I just enforce it. Craig, I think you didn't do a, a, your favorite line. The, the the line that I really love is when Torquil is telling Prince Colwyn about what fame means to him. And he says that fame is an empty purse. Count it, go broke. Eat it, go hungry. Seek it, go mad. Now, before we offer our own diabolical plans for your consideration, please help us to fulfill our own galaxy-conquering prophecy by leaving a written review. It makes a huge difference to our visibility and means more people will get to listen. Of course, if you'd prefer to limit our reach, then by all means, don't bother. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> <But> you. <laughs> In Krull, the beast sought to make Lyssa his queen by kidnapping her, giving her promises of power, and attempting to convince her that while love is fleeting, power is eternal. By taking her live via satellite to view Prince Colwyn, either getting off with the first woman he meets who offers him sex, or dying at her clawed hand. However, the beast is foiled when Colwyn rebuffs the devil woman's advances, and she in turn rebels against the beast by refusing to kill Colwyn having fallen in love with him, proving that power is fleeting and love eternal. But how did the panel of peril rate the beast's plan? Was it a diabolical concept? And how well was it pulled off? And let's start with Adam this time. Well, I think he's pushing in the wrong direction. and He's tr- he's trying to say, oh, that Colwyn, he's no good. He's no good. You can do better than him. Mm. And I think he should be more trying to woo Princess. Talk himself up instead of talking others down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all, it's all about the negative. So his plan easily falls apart. It could have succeeded, but it, when it does fall apart, it's everything's gone completely. So no, not not very good. But I think I might be able to address that with my plan. <laughs> Agree with that, Ben? Anything to add or elaborate on? No, I think it's pretty spot on. I was going to say something similar. First thing, kidnapping her. It's never going to win her over, is it? You want to marry someone? Don't kidnap them first. That's just yeah. that's just 101. But saying that, he is successful in kidnapping her, so he does get some broccoli for it for that. But overall, given that he's focusing his efforts on talking down Corwin rather than showing his more vulnerable and romantic side, which I may address in my plan, he's going to get two florets of broccoli Whoa. from me. Gosh. Very low. Oh, shit for the beast. just don't think it's a very good plan. All right. Well, Gaz, do you agree with that? Yeah. He's a blunt force object, isn't he? Just trying to smash his way to victory. It's not the way to, to conduct yourself around members of the opposite sex, or the same sex, for that matter. It was never going to work, and it doesn't, so... I think that tells you all you need to know about the beast, doesn't it, really? Beast by name, beast by nature. Matt, will you defend the beast's plan? I think he should have focused more on conquering than trying to woo this girl. It seemed like at the beginning of the movie, it's heavily implied. They're like destroying all of Krill's defenses. Like That seemed like it would have been a smarter plan than spending half the movie trying to to woo her. And yeah. not that he has any good qualities other than Colin sucks and I'm great. <laughs> Maybe he believed too much in the prophecy. And if he'd focused instead on thwarting the prophecy and just conquering Krull, he could have conquered the galaxy himself. I actually don't think the prophecy specifies that Lyssa is the queen. So he could have made anyone his queen, in theory. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see if that played into anybody's thinking, because we're going to move on to the competition round now. This is the part of the show where the panel of peril compete for the title of Most Diabolical. 
We'll each vote for our favourite, and at the end, the person with the most votes will be crowned the winner of this special episode. And I'd like to start with Adam's plan. No, you're not letting the guests go first. I thought he might not want to. Perhaps I don't want to. You thought about that? I don't care what you want. No, you don't give a shit, do you? (laughs) No. (laughs) Girls don't like boys. Girls like cars and money. (laughs) Given the choice between a handsome chap and somebody with more money and power than they know what to do with, they'll go for the latter. Colwyn might be a man of honour, but he's also a bit of a drip and can't match the beat's success and dark mystery. Oh, he's a bad boy. (laughs) The beast woos Lisa with pink spaceships and a custom-built palace for which she can choose the soft furnishings and also change the interior decor every six months if she wishes. Just as Lisa is coming round to the idea of eternal matrimony with the beast, he becomes a bit distant. Start staying out a bit late. Come back smelling of perfume. Ooh. He dumps Lisa and says he's found another galactic being who gets him and that he and Lisa never really got anything in common anyway. Lisa is incensed, but she doesn't realise that she's playing into the beast's plan. By dumping her, just as she, he thinks things will be good with the beast, he's making her want him in ways he normally could only dream of. Beast tells her that he's just purchased a timeshare with his new partner and that he doesn't want to lose his deposit. However, that if they'd stand any chance of getting back together, she'll have to get rid of Colwyn for good. Lisa tells Colwyn that she's found happiness with the Beast and also that Colwyn has terrible BO and that's too much to ignore. As Colwyn slumps off in rejection, in the distance, the Beast has also made Lisa massive and now... They neck on in a bizarre fashion above the treetops of a forest. (laughs) Why did he make it massive? So he can neck on with her. Okay. And in like (laughs) above a forest. So they're like the the forest trees are here. They're necking on, girl, and then like and then Colwyn's walking away from the forest all depressed. (laughs) Tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Well certainly. Does anybody have any questions or challenges for them? (laughs) I think you'll fan. That's uh, an absolutely perfect plan. Does seem airtight. So I guess boiling your plan down is it kind of treat him <laughs> mean, keep him keen? No, tr- no, treat him, treat him well, then dump him, send him to hell, <laughs> then pr- pr- pretend, and then pretend there's a little few little things he can do to win you back, <laughs> thinking she has the power. And that's not treating mean. <laughs> He doesn't treat her mean. He bought her a pink spaceship and a palace with com- complete with soft furnishings. How's that mean? How's that mean? Well, you got me there. Would you like a pink spaceship? I suppose I would in a way. Would you like a pink spaceship? Did you answer the question? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Gareth, yes, or- yes. Well, there you go. Shush then. <laughs> I've got one challenge, but I feel like it's going to destroy my plan. So I might please keep do. It. Yeah, so hush your mouth. <laughs> shush. Shush. Don't want to hoist your own petard too soon. Shush. Exactly. Well, then, (laughs) since he's said that, let's hear from Ben next. In a galaxy not so far away from the clichés of teen dramas, the Beast longs for Princess Lyssa. Their first meeting after the kidnapping is awkward. The Beast, clumsy with nerves, knocks over a telescope he's prepared for them to look at the night sky together. Even with unlimited power, it seems I can't escape my two left feet he says, red-faced. But as the beast begins to point out all the different stars and planets he's visited, Lyssa sees a side of him no one knows. A thoughtful, kind and deeply intelligent being with a quirky sense of humour. He tells her about his love of sausage dogs. (laughs) Something about those ickle-wickle legs supporting such an elongated body just makes him feel warm and fuzzy. She doesn't need to know that the something he has in mind is the little cuties rolled in breadcrumbs and sautéed over a medium heat for 15 minutes. <laughs> Inspired by his growing connection with Lyssa, the beast decides it's time for a change. He enlists the help of, I don't know, Zork or something, an alien stylist with a knack for polishing space turds. Zork works his magic, helping the beast trim his claws, styling his hair, which turns out to be quite luxurious, and teaching him the finer points of space manners. 
The big reveal comes at the annual Black Fortress prom. As Lissa enters the ballroom, the crowd parts way for what seems to be another fearsome entrance by the beast. Instead, she's greeted by a striking figure who blends confidence with a hint of vulnerability. Lissa's initial shock gives way to delight as she recognises the soul behind the new appearance. They share a dance to a Galactic Brothers synth-pop remix of a Cindy Lauper song. Her loins aflame, Lissa removes the beast's thick-rimmed, red-lens glasses, and, lo and behold, the beast turns out to be the most handsome being in all the galaxy. He was all along. It was the glasses, you see. They were hiding his comeliness beneath a nerdy veneer. But now, with the glasses removed, everyone can see that he looks quite like a cosmic Freddie Prince Jr. This is me, he says. No glasses, no mucus coating, just me. After they finish necking on, Lissa dumps Colwyn, citing the tightness of his pants and the limpness of... Sorry. And the limpness of his dialogue... <laughs> as two of the many reasons for the breakup. Lissa and the Beast marry the next day and have a litter of slimy babies. <laughs> See, another plan involving necking on. Good, I like it. <laughs> I think I might have realised what you were going to challenge and, and what you worried is going to destroy your plan, which is yeah. that the Beast can change his form at will. Yeah, yeah, and also that Colwyn is not the kind of guy to give up. That's true. Push it to the limits. <laughs> That's the point of no return. Yeah, he can change his form. That was the only thing I was going to say, really, was that his hair resembled like the roots of a of a leak or something like that in the film, didn't it? It was like white. Yeah. Stuff dangling down the back. Mm. But once they combed out the mucus, it was actually quite luxurious. <laughs> Did he smell? still smell a leak, though? So? Yeah. But yeah, that was the okay. shampoo. That's all right. I'd, I'd quite like somebody to smell leaks, actually. Anyone else got any questions or challenges for Ben before we move on? I don't think so. <laughs> I think Matt thinks it's foolproof. <laughs> well, the glasses, yeah, was what I that already got brought up. So nothing uh, new. All right, we'll hear next from Craig. That's me. I make Lissa watch as I scry on Colwyn, certain he will give in to temptation and mack on with my sexy changeling. No necking. As he rebuffs the advances of Vela and she declares her love for him. Lissa's belief in the power of love is reaffirmed. A blow, to be sure, but my power is great. Lissa, I say. I apologize. It was foolish of me to try to tempt Colwyn. He's a good man and I hope he makes you very happy. The truth is, I was just jealous because I... Uh, I have fallen for you. God, can't I even say the words? I love you, Lissa. I know I'm a big ugly fish guy, but I too have a heart, broken though it is. <laughs> when Colwyn arrives, I will step aside. Lissa looks confused but grateful, her eyes darting back and forth as she processes my words and tries to wrestle with trust and hope. She quickly wipes a tear from her cheek, crosses her arms defiantly and says, Good. Thank you. Oh, I mutter then. Oh, God. Curiosity gets the better of her. What? She inquires. Oh, nothing. What is it? She asks coyly. I shouldn't show you. It's private and it's perfectly healthy. Show me, she demands. I oblige. I show her an image of Colwyn getting sucked off by the Cyclops. <laughs> Lissa gasps. Please, I say. Do not judge these men, they have travelled far, and my changing has put them in the mood. Now now you do me, says the Cyclops, and Colwyn <laughs> obliges. Lissa gasps again, for he is extremely well endowed, and Colwyn struggles to accommodate his members. <laughs> Jesus wept. <laughs> You're right, she says, there's nothing wrong with it. Of course not, I reassure her, just a bit of healthy fun. Next, Colwyn begins to sodomise the magician Ergo and asks him to assume the form of Lissa. Ah, see how he thinks of you, I say reassuringly. But make her blonde, Colwyn instructs the magician, and give her a stronger jawline, she's so doughy. Lissa is quick to anger. So that's what he thinks of me, is it? The magician speaks next. Make me your queen, sire, for I, Ergo, have fallen in love with you. 
I can assume any form that pleases you. Yes, says Colwyn, seconds from release. Turn into me. That'll be well kinky. I've seen enough, says Lissa, sobbing. So I dismiss the scene and put my changelings at ease. Oh, my darling, I am so sorry. You can assume any form too, can't you? She snaps. Well, yes, but... Become Colwyn, but give him a cyclops dick and a better beard. (laughs) And make him beg for it. As you wish, my queen. Perhaps I could learn to love you, Mr. Beast. Please, Mr. the Beast was my father. Call me King Big Daddy Love Machine. (laughs) Wow. Any challenges or questions for me there? Or... <laughs> a, bit too, a bit too nauseous to answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't think the Cyclops would have a big dick. I think he'd be hung like an acorn. It doesn't matter because this is not the real Cyclops. This is a changeling enacting <laughs> yeah. out the scene. How many changelings did the beast have? Infinite. <laughs> I think she'd smell a rat. Say, wait a minute. The Cyclops, as well as being really tall, has got a big dick. No, I smell a rat. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Seems like a pretty weak challenge. <laughs> Tall people don't have big dicks. But, hey, but a challenge nonetheless. <laughs> well, we won't be able to include this in the broadcast, but what about uh, the tallest person I know? Absolutely huge monster on him. Uh, uh, what is this? Is this where you got the idea from? Is it? No, but <laughs> now you've brought it up. Yeah. Now you've brought it up. The tallest guy I know happens to be extremely well endowed. Well, I've I've never seen his penis, so um, I'll just. Have... Well, you count yourself lucky. You've never had to stand yeah, next to him at the urinal because it's horrible. You must be one of the only ones that haven't. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no further challenges other than tall people have small penises, so my point. <laughs> well, technically, uh, you just said the Cyclops and not tall people in general. Just the Cyclops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see you next from Gaz. The Beast sits in a makeup chair in front of a mirror making scary faces. <laughs> My name's the Beast, but to you, I'm Mr. Beast, he says. <laughs> Slightly annoyed that Craig nicked my thing at the, uh, at the end of his plan. However, I'll continue. A slayer mutters something into his ear hole. Hmm? What? There's another guy called Mr. Beast. Hmm. Is he very litigious about it? Oh, he is. <laughs> then to you, my name is the Beast. <laughs> The video begins with upbeat music and flashy graphics. The Beast himself appears on the screen, smiling and energetic. The Beast in tones. Hey, what's up guys? Today we've got an absolutely (laughs) crazy challenge ahead of us. We're going to be convincing a hostile woman to marry us. Yep, you heard that (laughs) right. But don't worry, we've got a plan and we're going to make it happen. Let's dive right in. Cut to a montage of the Beast preparing for the challenge, doing a few jumping jacks, gathering supplies, and strategizing with his team. All right, step one, research. We need to know everything about Lisa. What are her interests? What are her passions? What makes her tick? We've got to be prepared. Cut to the Beast and his slayers conducting research, reading tea leaves or something, and gathering information. Step two, connection. We need to find common ground with her. Whether it's a shared hobby, a mutual friend, or a similar life goal, we need to establish a connection to break down those barriers. Cut two, the beast engaging in activities related to Lisa's interests, such as holding flames in their bare hands and producing (laughs) offspring that will eventually rule over the galaxy. The beast is back, he says. Step three, show her the real you. Authenticity is key, guys. We've got to let her see who we truly are, flaws and all. No pretending to be someone we're not. Cut two. The Beast having a heart-to-heart conversation with his bros, showing vulnerability, crushing his foes underfoot, and just being genuine, really. The Beast says, Step four. Win over her friends and family. We need allies in this battle, guys. If her loved ones approve of us, it's going to make our case a whole lot stronger. Cut to the Beast, meeting with Lisa's friends and family, bonding with them, and gaining their support, slash threatening to laser shoot them for non-compliance. The Beast waffles on further. Step 5. 
Sweep her off her feet. We're going big on this one, guys. Grand gestures, romantic surprises, you name it. We want to leave her speechless. And if that means putting a magic seal over her mouth, then go for it. Kept to the beast, planning and executing elaborate romantic gestures, such as surprise dates, gifts, and heartfelt gestures, such as presenting her with the heart of a cyclops. Or perhaps uh, a large member? Yeah, the large member of the cyclops. The beast concludes. And step six, pop the big question. It's now or never, guys. We've put in the work, we've shown her how much we care, and now it's time to seal the deal and put a ring on it. Cut to the beast, pacing nervously as he prepares to propose, followed by the big moment where he asks Lisa to marry him. And there you have it, guys. With a little bit of strategy, a whole lot of heart, a small amount of destruction, and a ton of determination, we've convinced a hostile woman to marry us. Remember, anything is possible if you put your mind to it. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay awesome. The video ends with the beast flashing a big thumbs up and a big smile before the screen fades to black. What I found a little bit unconvincing about that is that the beast didn't urge you to like or subscribe at any point. Oh, during... oh shit. Oh, <laughs> well, he, he's recorded it on VHS, hasn't he? Who's he asking? <laughs> <laughs> also, Mr. Beast is way more evil than the beast. <laughs> I've never actually watched any of his videos. No, but I know that he locked people in a shopping mall and asked them to survive alone for several months and they could win like $10,000. Last one alive wins. (laughs) (laughs) Battle Royale meets Dead Rising. Uh, Anybody got any questions or challenges there for Gaz? It's just a general wooing, charm offensive. Yeah, it doesn't feel like very convincing. He's already murdered her family. I'm just going to hold this shrug the whole time now. <laughs> Help Hal's listening. I'm shrugging on the camera. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. Is that right? Does he, in in the opening kind of salvo, does he kill the, their parents? Definitely the kills. Previous. Yeah, Mrs. they're Dad. all dead. Uh, in the castle. Yeah. In the it's hard castle. to woo a f- dead family. Yeah. yeah. Believe me. Well, that's good because uh, I, I was almost going to say something along the lines of get to her through her sister but then I thought well she doesn't ha- necessarily have one I'd have to make one up and then convince you that, that she did definitely exist yeah. she was she just off like camera the whole time yeah. <laughs> okay well let's finish with our guest plan and let's hear from Matt well, first I'm going to say that I'm <laughs> I'm going to lose this competition <laughs> <because>. <laughs> I thought about it more analytical, and I didn't. I didn't think about it in an entertaining enough way. Well, <laughs> you guys. don't no. don't let that put you off, because usually any entertainment that we provide is to disguise the fact that we haven't thought of a good idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is it. We're, we're exactly. very tired. This is our second recording session in two days. We just want to go to bed. <laughs> Well, the beast wants to conquer the planet Kroll after months and months of fighting with the Slayers, facing many resistance. It dawns upon him. I'll have my changelings infiltrate the inner circles of both kingdoms, convincing them that the prophecy is not true, that they will not only not be king and queen of Kroll, their son will not conquer the galaxy. I'll have one of my changelings disguise herself as the princess to convince Cullen she wants nothing to do with him. She does not want this marriage, and they go their separate Mm -hmm. ways. Debating long and hard about how to woo the princess, the beast finally just says, hey, I'm one ugly bastard, and I can change my shape to look like anybody. I'll just make myself more (laughs) handsome than Cullen and be a prince for another kingdom. (laughs) Simple, easy, (laughs) save the whole movie, and I will marry the princess, and then reveal... Like most marriages, I'm a big, ugly beast. <laughs> After she's already mine. <laughs> Our son conquers the galaxy. I know it's simple, but I figured simple is effective. Sometimes the best plans we have, um, sometimes the, the simplest one wipes the floor with us all, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Occam's yeah. razor. <laughs> Why do we all think of that? Yeah, I do feel bad I didn't come up with any voices like you guys did. Which, yeah. <laughs> oh. Now, as I say, that's all pure front. <laughs> can, can we hear your British? Can you do a British accent? Oh, God. I've never had to do an accent for actual <laughs> 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 yeah, my, Well, this is from a movie. My stepson and I always go, it's Leviosa, not uh, Leviosa. Leviosa. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's really a British accent, but in the, the Quidditch game, <laughs> the guy from uh, Slytherin, take that side. 
<laughs> Always love that. I don't remember that one. That's enough of my pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Do your all-purpose American accent, Adam. Let's say she's anywhere in America. My, my all-purpose all American accent. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Doesn't right. matter which part of America it is. <laughs> it's the imagined part of America. <laughs> Some truly diabolical schemes there, but who will get the votes? First, I'll recap the plans. So, first, we had Adams treat him well, then mean, keep him keen, say they smell. Yeah, oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we had Ben's ugly muckling monster makeover plan. Then we had my love is love plan. Mm-hmm. Next, we had Gaz's Mr. Beast YouTube campaign plan. And finally, we had Matt's secret invasion and Al Bundy style marriage plan. <laughs> Are we including ourselves? Or are we just? Are we oh, you everybody? cannot vote for yourselves, okay, you right. saucy babies. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's my biggest problem with this podcast is that I can't vote for myself. <laughs> yeah, you vote for yourself every week. We'd, we'd yep. all end up with 20 points then, wouldn't we, every season? I definitely have the so. best plan every week, that's why. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, Adam, uh, as you went first with the plans, who did you vote for? Well, like I said, sometimes it's the simplicity that wins through the day, uh, and I've gone for Matt. Hey, Ben, who have you voted for? Well, I have also voted for the simplest plan. And the one that, when I heard it, I thought, oh, yeah, why didn't why didn't I, you just do that? It's mine. So simple. Is it, is it mine? And I voted for Matt. Oh, there's another yeah, one for Matt. Yeah. And Matt, I should tell you at this point, our guests usually don't get this many votes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sycophantic. It's no, not. No, genuine, <laughs> yeah. And And to prove it, Here's the third vote for you. Hey. Nice. <laughs> it's a very good plan. Uh, Gaz, have you differed? Well, I liked the uh, the final reveal of the beast's true form to his wife once they're married, which mm-hmm. I'm sure we can all relate to to one degree or another. And that was yeah. that was the line that capped it for me as well. <laughs> yeah, it was very good. <laughs> now that we're married, don't expect me to keep showering. <laughs> Those days are over. <laughs> Clean underpants. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Well, Matt, it's a clean sweep for you, uh, and you are our winner. Congratulations. But what matters to us? Who's got the pity point? Who? No, not the pity point. Whoever you <laughs> voted for is the real champion because you oh. are the guest, and you've cho- what you're basically saying is which one of us is the best of us. So who, who gets you're, that? You're going all oh. in on yourself here, aren't you, Craig? <laughs> well, I had to go. Kudos to everyone because I thought you guys were way more creative than I was, but I had to go. Yes. Craig. Oh, there's something going on here. I don't like this. Cyclops you two are too cock friendly. Just... I know I saw this from the start. Just the bloody old boys Cyclops club, cock just put it over the top for me. <laughs> that, now, we know, we know, now we know Matt's buttons. This is it. How many episodes have you been on? How many? Yeah. If That's we have Matt, no Matt for... We'll have my back one day for X Men. I'll do a similar plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt is our winner. And. Thank you once again, Matt, for joining the panel of Peril this week and for bringing us Krull. And now yeah. we'd like to give you the mic. So tell us, where can our listeners enjoy more of your diabolical mind? Well, first, thanks really for having me. It was really great to be here. I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Uh, I am on a bit of a hiatus right now, but if you could check out my podcast, Matt Spectro Through the Multiverse, every episode, it's me and a special guest, and we talk comic books and animation. Uh, you can find me... Uh, on all major platforms, Podbean, Spotify, you name it, uh, Apple Podcasts. And you can find me on social media, at Matt Spectro. On Twitter, uh, Matt Spectro through the Multiverse. On Facebook. And if you're so inclined, you can even go to Hive. I'm on Hive, and you can find me at Matt Spectro, all Is lowercase Hive? letters. I don't even know what Hive is. I think we're on Hive, but I don't think we ever post Hive. Uh, I post like once a month, maybe. Yeah. Okay. This is when everybody was like, oh, Twitter's dead. We're leaving Twitter, and yeah, then nobody's left it yet. Nobody's left it. <laughs> no, yeah. it was when Twitter became Groundhog's Day, where every day it was like, "That's it. Yeah. It's done. It's good. It's, yeah. I'll see yeah. you tomorrow. <laughs> Goodbye." And then the next day it would be back up, and everybody <laughs> yeah. would do it all over again. And that's it for this special guest episode. Thank you for listening. And if you want your children to rule the galaxy, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, and leave us a review on the very platform on which you're currently listening. 
follow us on social media at DiabolicalPod and follow Matt Spectro through the multiverse at Matt Spectro. Stay tuned for future guest appearances and go back to listen to our previous guests to see how they rank against Matt. And remember, power is fleeting. Love is eternal. Candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. (laughs) (laughs) We hope you'll join us next time, where our guest will be Jesse Hawken of Junk Filter Pod. And we will be discussing Dan Aykroyd's sole directorial effort, Nothing But Trouble, starring Chevy Chase and John Candy. It's a wild one, let me tell you, you're not going to want to miss this. See you next time.